Why don't we start by having you guys introduce yourselves and what your companies do and your role there. I have to go first. Sure, we can have Dave go first. <laughs> Hello, I'm David Kamira. I work for Sage Software. We do accounting, payroll, time and attendance, fixed assets. We do a little bit of everything for small and medium sized businesses. Um, I work in the time and labor department developing uh, time and attendance software and integrations with other products. Uh, hi, I'm Garrett Arrowwood. I work for a company called Power Home Remodeling that's based out of Philadelphia. Uh, one of uh, 20 plus developers um, that are span across the, the world, mostly the United States, but Brazil and Australia and some other places. Um, the software I work on for them, and we all, uh, all the developers work on is an ERP. We work on an internal software. The company actually specializes in exterior home remodeling that saves on power. So they, they build, market, sell, install, inspect, and perhaps even offer financing um, through affiliations with Wells Fargo and other banking for people that install uh, high-end, very high-end front doors, windows, roofing, solar panels, siding, anything on the outside of the house. My name is Cecily Reed. Uh, I work at Tin Roof Software. We're a startup that's been it's about two years old now. Uh, I think we just recently reached about 120 people. Um, as I mentioned before, we basically do custom software for companies. So I'm a contractor at Cox Communications. We have people all over the city. Uh, my project specifically is with the video on demand at Cox. So we. My team makes sure that you get your Game of Thrones, well not you, Cox isn't in Atlanta unfortunately, um, but we make sure that customers get their Game of Thrones episodes on time. So the project that I'm working on is more of an internal tool, uh, looking at data analytics, uh, especially when we are doubling the amount of hours that are available on, to all of our customers. So I do anything from deploying the application to our servers to coming up with entirely new spec for a report. Um, I've been fortunate enough to be with this project from the very beginning. Uh, so it's pretty interesting seeing it grow uh, into a massive historical database and data reporting. I think that's it. Cool. So um, specifically, what part does Ruby play in the stack? And is it something that's kind of always been there? Was it more recently added? And what's been your experience with it so far? Um, I was initially uh, working for a company called PayChoice, which was acquired by Sage. So I've been between both companies for a total of seven years. And PayChoice was a .NET workshop. And I was a black sheep because that brought Ruby and Linux into this Microsoft world and really disrupted their whole ecosystem. So uh, once we were acquired by Sage uh, two years ago, uh, turns out Sage is very much of a Linux and Ruby uh, workshop. So you know they do have a few other products and Java and uh, .NET, but we're primarily Ruby. So uh, it's pretty cool to see you know. Uh, client-facing applications that you've built. It's uh, mostly all software as a service that um, you know, people are using. And um, my company, I think it's about 30 years old. It might be a little older than that. But they, own, they stopped using paper and started building uh, their own internal application about 10 years ago. Uh, it's a Rails 3.2.23.1. I believe 20, maybe 22.1 has that security update in it. Um, yeah, it's, it's mostly all Rails. We have another internal app that, that relies heavily on React. Um, we all sort of touch the full stack. On, on the front end of the main Rails application, it's just a lot of jQuery tied together based on Vue, so there's no front end framework. Um, it's a lot of, our particular stack is a lot of just data representation. It's a lots and lots and lots of views that different people use that represents lots and lots of data and, and information. So. Uh, so my project is unfortunately named Spice, but uh, if I say Spice, you, that's the name of my project. It's an acronym that we somehow voted on, but I despise it because now I'm the Spice Girl. I hate it. Anyway, um, so this Spice 
came about because of legacy code from a vendor. We actually still get updates from this vendor. We kind of use the API from the vendor, um, but when this project first fell into our laps, the plan was to use Java Hibernate. Um, my background is I went to Georgia Tech for computer science, so Java was definitely my comfort zone. Um, Hibernate, not so much, but I, we started going down that road of using Java Hibernate. Uh, the bad news is the database that we had to work from, uh, from this vendor, was horribly, horribly designed, like not optimized at all. None of the names make any sense. So with Hibernate, doing anything with that database was a nightmare. Um, my boss, thankfully, had other Ruby on Rails projects throughout the city, um, so he kind of convinced Cox to let us do something newer. I don't think Cox has any other projects that are Ruby on Rails based, really. If it is, it's because an outside vendor you know, specifically told them, this is what we're going to sell you. Um, so as this internal project is going to become Ruby on Rails, I was very happy about that, just because dealing with the database became so much easier. So much easier, it's almost uh, comical that we were gonna do Java Hibernate. Um, so pretty much our entire project is heavily Ruby on Rails. Uh, so yeah, I think that's a nice cool. question. So I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. Um, we have a bunch of people here who are looking for jobs or trying to get their kind of foot in the door and a couple of you are hiring, right? So um, what, you know, separates the people that maybe you get an interview and they're like, all right, they're all right, but we can't, we're not going to hire them versus the people you do hire. Like, what is sort of the key thing that you guys look for or that you found sort of makes the difference between who you want on your team and who's not going to be on your team? Um, <clears throat> you know, honestly, for me, uh, boot camps and stuff really hold no weight. Uh, There's so many of them out there. I know of like one or two. And, you know, I don't see one as better than the other. I'd actually rather have someone with uh, little to no experience or self-taught experience be able to bring them into our company and be able to show them here's how we do things and you know really kind of mold them to fit in our ecosystem. Uh, so for me, looking at uh, code review, you know, if you have personal projects that you've worked on, on your resume you submit a GitHub link, uh, that's going to really give me an idea of, you know, what's your coding style? Um, can we work with that to fit into our ecosystem and with our team? So, you know, really code reviews uh, is the biggest thing for me to really see where you're at on your uh, level of experience as well as just how you think about approaching a problem. I've not been in a position to hire anybody yet, but I've, I've gone through a lot of interviews um, as I'm, on, I'm pretty fresh in, this is my, my second job, but I only, uh, second full-time job. I've taken a fair amount of interviews, but I, I can tell you from that experience is that I feel like there's always this round of um, making sure you're not an asshole. Um, and it, but but what, I, what I, I, I mentioned that, not because people, it's not asshole's too strong of a word, but just making sure that you, you can work with and communicate well with. If I, if I were hiring somebody, I, w I would look for first a, an eagerness and, and enthusiasm about learning new tools, about you know, being excited about what you do. Um, then two and second, mo most importantly, just being a clear communicator, um, being able to speak clearly to one another, and then three, I don't know, being able to listen is really important. There's certainly a lot of people I've met throughout my entire life that really like to talk, but don't really spend too much time listening. So that, that's certainly what I would be valuing. Um, so I'm in the same situation where I don't necessarily have the say of who gets hired or not, um, but considering that I'm the lead developer on the team, my boss does take my opinion into account. Um, I know one of the things that is very important to me is uh, we do uh, a project. We like give you a link to like some some example data, and we ask you create a Rails app around it. I think the latest one is um, a photo album. So set up like a user and be able to click through the photo album pictures, so on and so forth. Um, most of the what you need is there. You just have to set up the the app. Um, 
it is kind of disappointing when you see someone that I feel like they can do the job, but when they when we look at the project, the only thing that they did was create the models. Uh, there's not views. There's there's nothing else that's really there, um, even though. I think we give them maybe two or three days to work on it. Uh, so I say that to say, be sure that what you show in this project is adequate to show your development skills. Just doing the models is not enough to convince us that you know what you're doing. Um, a GitHub will definitely go a long way if in the event that we're kind of rushing you through the process and we only give you 24 hours, that GitHub will be a nice fallback even if you don't have the opportunity to finish the project, which I know has been the case with some people. Um, the other thing to that is definitely be interested in learning. Um, like I mentioned, I learned, I think I mentioned, I learned Ruby on Rails on my job. Um, I don't think we have any issue with hiring people that have no experience, but we need to be confident that they can learn it in like a month. And it's a lot of information to take in. So someone that is really like, yes, I'm ready to go. I can confidently do this in a month without actually having to be handheld all the time. Um, so try and convey that to whoever's hiring you could really go a long way if you don't have enough experience. Yeah, so I'll add a little bit to my own question here. I think, I, th I agree with everything you guys said. I think especially just really liking to code, like really enjoying that process. So I know a couple of years ago, I uh, was working with a company and they hired someone who actually was somewhat underskilled for the position. But when they went in and did a code exercise with them, it was so clear, like they couldn't figure it out, but they really wanted to figure it out. Like they, after the interview came back and were just like, please like help me, I really want to understand how that problem worked because like it's driving me crazy. Like I wanted to know how, how it worked. And then they actually came back later and hired the guy because it was just like, it's really clear he wants to do this, right? Like he's going to spend the extra effort and, um, so I, I think that's also really interesting, just like really liking the process of coding will take you a long way. Um, I've not met a Ruby developer who didn't like to code. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I want to now, I've kind of gotten through some of the initial questions I wanted to get through. I wanted to open it for a little bit to the audience if you guys have questions or I'll, I'll continue. So anyone just raise your hand if you have a question you want to ask these guys. All right. Yeah, I, I'm curious about um, why you guys might hire someone locally versus uh, offshoring. So um, our company, we, we work with clients. I'm a contractor to Cox. So my Cox boss is actually a client. Um, if I don't do a good job, I don't you know, make Cox happy, we might lose a contract, we might lose out on money. Um, a lot of our companies are more traditional in that they don't necessarily allow remote work or someone in, you know, that's not locally to be there. Uh, I wish that wasn't the case because then I can answer meetings all the time from my apartment. Um, it might make hiring a little easier, uh, but for us, our clients want to see who they are working with, who's developing it. They want to see demos. They want to be a part of the meetings with the business requirements. So that's not an option for us at all. Uh, everyone in my company works remote. Uh, I used to think more about the word offshoring in my last job, but this one, I would say, I mean, I communicate so much with the people I work with because we're all remote. I think in a situation where some companies have some people that work at the company and some that are remote, there can be this divide in how they view one another and how much they're communicating. But since everyone is working remote and we have, we're very strict scrum, we have Lot, we have stand-up every day and a lot of other meetings throughout the week, only one week sprint, so demos and backlog groomings and retrospectives and all that. I see and talk with everybody all the time. And I'm just saying this because, uh, I mean, I, I talk with my friends that I work with in Brazil every day. I don't particularly feel they're very far away. So, I don't... I, Yeah, Brazil, the people in Brazil were, were pretty aligned, but yeah, with the people we have in um, uh, the Philippines and we have in Australia, uh, yeah, there's always somebody around in case, there's a, you know, in case there's a fire, which hopefully there never is. Yeah, and at Sage, um, as far as working remote, uh, we do have offices really all over the world. So we're about 13,000 employees. <clears throat> 
So, um, I mean, really, you can go anywhere and go into an office. Uh, personally, I like, I'm kind of old school, I like the office. It's an open floor plan. I like going into there and getting my work done. Uh, however, there's been several days where I just say, you know what, I'm working from home today. So we're extremely flexible in that sense, being able to work remotely, uh, but then report into the office, or if it's just a straight up remote position. So, you know, talent's everywhere, so I don't want to limit it to a certain uh, locality if the talent's better somewhere else. Uh, as far as offshoring, do you mean like um, third party companies pitching in on your application or? Okay, yeah, well, we have several thousand employees working over in the UK, Germany, France, uh, Spain, and Brazil, so um, I'm pretty sure they're open to it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, do you know where in Brazil? No, I don't. Sorry. Any other questions? Uh, for us, that's great um, because Tin Roof, their company is built around their talent. Uh, so if you are versatile in your languages, that's even better if there's you know a new client and we need to fill that spot real fast. It's easier to just bring someone that you trust that's been working within Tin Roof at another project and just move them to another one. Um, so having that background in diverse languages is definitely a plus. Um, I don't, we don't turn anyone away if they only have one language or if they have multiple. Uh, I definitely think people feel like having some experience in development at all is it's rather easy to pick up another language or to learn something else. And that's kind of what happened to me. Like I said, my background is more Java, MATLAB, scripting, knew nothing about Ruby on Rails, but you know, I was at Cox at the time. They picked up this project, so I switched into being more of a Ruby on Rails developer. So it's great. I'm actually gonna move, I've been on this project for about two years now, so I'll be moving to NCR for a Java Springbot position next year. Cool. Um, yeah, so the, the way my company actually hires, um, not just developers, but my company's a little over 2,000 people. 90% plus is all referrals from other people internal in the company. Um, so with that, it's, you know, it's like a good thing and a bad thing. It's mostly a good thing for the company because they're everyone, you know, you're only somebody that someone else thinks this would be a good fit for the, for the group that I work in. Um, would even like be able to apply. I don't, I've not really seen an open job application for the company. Uh, but with that said, I say that because um, they do, my experience was that it was a very basic, um, along with a couple other series of interviews, a very basic rails challenge in which you were pairing. And I, I could definitely see that anyone at my company that um, doesn't have as much experience with, with Ruby and rails, but has experience in other things would certainly be nurtured. Because the actual like code challenge spot, which is rails specific, you can't like be coming in completely. I don't know. I don't know anything about this technology, but um, there, there's so much pairing and there's so much communication and there's so much nurturing that it, it wouldn't be any any issue with with anyone with a lot of experience in something else, but a little bit of experience in, in Ruby and Rails, making making their way into where I work. You know, I think uh, every company has their own little ecosystem where uh, they find their niche and which language to use, which tool sets to use. However, at the same time, uh, we are really flexible as far as your tool sets that you want to use and uh, the type of computer you want and stuff. So very flexible in that sense. But to your question, as far as uh, knowing different languages coming in, I think there's a lot of value to it, especially, you know, I mean, let's face it, Ruby is slow. It's not fast. And being able to write um, uh, extensions in C, Erlang, uh, uh, different languages to really give your complex business logic calculations a speed boost 
is a very good thing. You know, um, as far as PHP and uh, Python, other scripting languages, I don't know if they would really have too much of a use, except for maybe just um, your different way of thinking in those languages and being able to really bring something to the team as far as uh, experience. But um, yeah. One thing to note, so this is kind of specific to Tin Roof, but I would imagine it wouldn't be it would be the case at other places. We have a lot of legacy code from just the entire infrastructure of video on demand, getting content from distributors like HBO to customers. We there's so many different scripts that are used, there's so many different languages. We have mobile developers for different things. So having someone that's familiar with these different languages will make it easier to kind of integrate with other things if need be. So if I would say that's kind of a selling point for you as well. If the job kind of requires taking an API that is you know, not Ruby on Rails based or taking legacy code that isn't Ruby on Rails based, but you're trying to turn that into a Rails app, is definitely a benefit as well. Um, to kind of a, you know, a classic world type questions about technical interviewing and the use of whiteboards, they are used. In the interview, and also um, polite but persistent emailing or LinkedIn messages about opportunities. If you have any anecdotes about those, whether they help or don't help, uh, to, what do you mean persistent? Link? Uh, sometimes we will apply for a job and we say, oh, I'm just checking in, or is there something further I can add, or variations of that sort of. And I've been told various things that that's good or it's not worth it, or any anecdotes that are just helpful to okay. the wider picture. So um, first, the technical interviews. Um, my job specifically, thankfully, actually, no, they, when I interviewed for this job, uh, I did do a whiteboard, but it wasn't as bad as other companies. I interviewed at Google, and that was grueling. Um, and <laughs> hate, I hate technical interviews. It's, I, I can't stand them. It makes me very anxious. I tend to like more where I can do a project or, you know, giving a code example um, more than being put on the spot because it seems like everything goes out my, just it disappears. Um, so I'm thankful that Tin Roof kind of switched from, you know, a whiteboard thing to where just take your time and do this project on your own time. Um, Unfortunately, it's still something you'll have to deal with. So uh, there's definitely a lot of resources out there to make it easier. Uh, I think getting together, this is a great resource, so finding other people, like, okay, what kind of questions did you ask? Glassdoor is a great place to go as well for some sample interviews. Um, that would make it a lot better for you. In terms of contacting people, I am very much, I think it's okay to contact people. Um, be sure to ask. So if you interview or have a phone call, ask at the end. So when can I expect to hear from you? And if that time passes, you are totally in the clear. Like you have the right to kind of say, okay, you told me next Tuesday you're gonna hear. I was gonna hear something from you. I haven't heard anything in two weeks. So it's perfectly within your right, especially if you have something to go off of. If not, I would probably go with check back in a week. If they didn't give you any data or deadline, check back in a week. But don't make that a weekly thing. Probably do one week, two weeks, and then eventually, I guess, take the hint, <laughs> unfortunately. But yeah, I, there's nothing wrong with you checking up. Um, let's see, whiteboarding. I never, I've never taken an interview that had me whiteboard. Um, I've never had to do any sort of whiteboarding anything for anything I've ever done with technology whatsoever in my limited experience, but never. Um, as far as reaching back, um, I agree with everything you said. I, I, I think it's probably a personal thing, but I don't mind uh, reaching back out the very day you had an interview to say how it was a pleasure meeting with you and anything off the top of your head like, oh, I didn't really mention this, something else you wanted to really get across or what you, how you feel you really wanted to represent yourself. Um, I think that's a good call. And then I would follow the sort of same guidelines. Like if you know you've been told like a certain date, reach out on that date if you haven't heard by that date. Um, and then if not, one week, two weeks, and that's probably it. A little uh, corny tip is 
I used to have handwritten thank you notes. Like I would go to the interview with um, a thank you card. Uh, and as soon as everything is said is done, I would you know, finish up whatever thank you I needed to add, be more specific on who I was interviewing. And I would leave that in the front desk or their mailbox because you save a stamp and uh, they get it quicker. So that's a pretty helpful tip. And it tends to be more personal and hopefully you'll stick out more than all the other people that are just emailing saying thank you for interviewing me. Yeah, as far as whiteboarding for me, um, I hate asking uh, coding questions or coding tests. I think they're really lame. Uh, I would much rather be able to just carry a conversation with someone you know, given this scenario, um, what would your migrations look like? Or, you know, given these different kind of fields, you know, where do you think you could optimize your database? Or how would you approach uh, solving this kind of problem? You know, just something where it's very much of more of a pseudo answer, not something that you have to write down. And, you know, it's really just getting what is your way of thinking? What is your approach uh, to something like this? You know, if you were to apply back saying that you would write a nested if statement that's 30 levels deep, well, it's not going to be too good for you, but, you know, because there's much better ways of doing stuff than that. But that, it still lets us know your way of thinking into something. Um, what was the other part of the question? Following up. Oh, yeah, following up. Uh, I'm really persistent. So uh, it's got me a job sometimes. Sometimes they told me to quit contacting them. Oh, man. So, uh, you know, if they tell me, like, oh, you know, just check back with us later, I'm going to check back with you tomorrow and the day after. So I'm extremely persistent. And that's just because I hate waiting for something that's unknown. And it's just, you know, a little tick of mine. But, uh, as far as advice, personally, I don't work with third-party recruiters. Uh, they are very annoying. Uh, I get uh, emails all the time saying like, hey, you would be the perfect fit for this client of mine, and it's for like a .NET position. I'm like, no, I really would not. <laughs> Trust me. So, um, you know, I would find a company who their product is a, uh, something that I believe in, something that I enjoy, and something that I want to be a part of. Um, I think that's going to really separate you from anyone else, is if you go in there already knowing the company, doing your research, knowing what they offer, and what you can bring to the table for them. That's going to go uh, a lot further than anything else in my opinion. And I like your idea of the handwritten thank you notes or, I mean, I would never do that. Yeah, I would my, do that. <laughs> but that's really cool I'm idea. I'm a for it for sure. I'd be like, oh, it's so sweet. See, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, oh, and one more thing, you know, uh, be attentive to details. Now, I've gotten a resume before where the footer, it had an email, john.doe at example.com. Don't do that. You know, <laughs> proofread your resume. You know, proofread your code before you send a link to your GitHub profile or something. You know, it's just going to make you stand out a lot more and shows that you really care. So one final question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, first off, thanks for coming out, guys, and answering our questions. Um, this is my first community meetup. Um, but I wanted to know a little bit more about um, the outlook your companies have um, towards their developers growth um, so I know on the one hand we mentioned that uh, some employers are looking for um, you know, potential candidates who have an eagerness to learn while other companies are saying you know we want the specific skill set um, in your experience when, you, when you're you know, working on a problem and you see that there's an area uh, where you could grow in um, if you say something like I don't know the answer to that, but I'm going to look into this and maybe it'll take me two days or three days or whatever. How, um, how perceptive are, are they to, you know, your development growth in your, in your companies and, and how has that changed um, from previous ones, if that makes sense. 
So I've been fortunate to be in a situation where I've, I've gotten to a point where I have a lot of leeway with the project, um, which is a rare thing early in my career. Uh, but I've certainly found that both Cox and Tin Roof, they've been very supportive of anything that I want to kind of look into a little more. Um, if I want to take time and go to conferences about a database or go to the Rails conference or anything of that sort, they may actually fund that. Um, even with, we use Splunk, which is like um, looking at logging, it's like a monitoring kind of thing. Uh, that seemed to be a need for the client and it might be something that we can use on our servers. So I was like, I can dive into that a little more. So they're supporting me in that and giving me the resources I need to do that. Um, so I think my company is very receptive. I've never, I haven't had them tell me no about something. They're very, uh, they embrace teaching everyone uh, and if you are in a position for a year doing one language and you tell them you know what this project isn't for me they'll work it out and kind of help you figure out what it is that you want to do um, yeah and I've, that's not only with me but I've seen that with a lot of different people Another question, or I'll throw my take. My take is, yeah, is uh, my company just wants us to learn. Our CIO, which is really our CTO, um, he's in a lot of the meetings, and he's always asking, what did you learn today? Did you learn something today? Um, everybody I work with is really knowledgeable, even if they've started in this field recently, because we all you know, work hard and study hard. So it's all, all, about, all about learning more things and and inserting, if we if we think anything, as long as it's it's serving the uh, need of making the application better and helping the people who use our application within the company, uh, improving it, they're open for us to do absolutely anything in any particular language or framework or tool, or they would be down as long as we are knowledgeable enough to uh, to have studied up and, and convinced them that that it's a good idea. But their their ears are wide open, and they and they always want us to be looking at for things. So. Yeah, we are really open to uh, different things as well. Um, you know, unfortunately, we probably have a lot more red tape than you guys, so we have to jump through hoops. Usually, I just ask for forgiveness for a lot of those things because I hate red tape. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, really, whatever gets the job done, you know, efficiently. You know, as far as learning new stuff, um, you know, I learn new things about Ruby all the time, uh, and Rails, just a different method here or there, or a different way of doing something, a new gem, a new approach uh, to stuff, and I take the time to learn it at work, you know, as well as go home and read more up on it. So I think it's highly encouraged because, you know, if you don't, then 13 years later, you can be working on legacy software with a legacy language, not making any new breakthroughs. So if you're not learning, then you're stagnant, and I think that's a bad thing. Cool, so one final, oh. I do have a question. Yeah. So we have a mixture of people in a consulting role and an internal role and like financial role. Um, project metrics and time tracking, even if just for internal or client billing, what are, how do your development teams have to do? Do you have to like start a clock when you're working on this billable activity? Or is it just say, I work for these days on these stories? How is, how is that tracked in y'all's organizations? And what role does the developer have to do? So um, for us, I actually have to track my time twice, unfortunately. It first started with Tin Roof, and then Cox decided they want to track our time there as well. Um, for Cox, I do a hodgepodge of things. So they have tasks split. So like um, architecture design, meetings, project management, uh, documentation, deployment, all of that. I usually, just at the end of the day, just give my best guess of, OK, I was actually doing some development for about four hours. And after lunch, for the rest of the hours, I did documentation. So it's not strict to the point where I need to start my time and all that wonderful stuff. Um, with our tickets, we do try and do estimates on how long that ticket will be, just so we 
have an idea of how many hours we can put into a specific sprint. Um, and we also try and see if that's accurate. So if I say it's going to take five business days for this and it really took two, uh, it's kind of a great thing to kind of brag about to Cox. So that's the only really real way we track our time. Um, salary position. Uh, they don't track our time whatsoever. They actually try to make sure we're not working too much. They can. They try to not have us work on the weekends. If they see someone like making, you know, get pushes, they'll be like, "What are you doing?" Um, I do have a number of meetings I have to go to. Uh, you know, just stand-ups. But all those meetings sort of add up when it's only a one-week sprint. You have a cycle of various things, so you're sort of like on the clock. You need you need to be no matter what time zone you're in, for whatever team you're on, you need to be at these particular meetings. But other than that. Um, they, I mean, they, they gauge, they make sure we're having fun. They actually ask how, you know, how your week was and they, you have to give them a number that they monitor just to make sure everything's going okay. I imagine that if you give a low number for a while, they're going to reach out to you, but they're all about us having a good time. <coughs> so there's no, there's no time monitoring whatsoever. Yeah. Developers at our company are salaried, um, and we don't track our time really. Uh, we don't track our office hours, really. Uh, I basically come in when I want to and I leave when I want to uh, because my work's done every day. So um, it's not that big of a deal. However, as far as like issues and stuff, bugs that come up uh, and just generally what you're working on, they do want you to track because they get taxable credits for those hours working on certain types of things. So for that purpose alone, they want to uh, track your time. But it's really just, you know, I worked one day on this or I worked, you know, five hours on this issue, but that's it. Uh, we have daily stand-up meetings and we're on about a, a three-week sprint release. So, you know, I think a one week would be pretty, pretty rough. <laughs> Um, but that way, you know, you have a bit of breather room, but you also have a lot of deliverables. So our company, we uh, develop software that we sell as a service. So we're not creating um, software for clients, but, you know, it's self-hosted software and stuff. So it's a lot uh, different than um, some of the other models. And we have deliverables. We tell clients that, hey, we're going to get this feature set in to the sprint. And we have to meet that deliverable. So we have a QA department. So our test coverage is rather lacking because we're trying to get features in and stuff. But then we have a whole beautiful QA department that tests for all the issues and stuff that come up. But you know, it's kind of expected that you do your due diligence, write your own tests, and you know, make sure that stuff's just not horribly broken. Because I mean, at the end of the day, uh, the software that I work on employees for other clients and businesses use to track their time, then that's how they get paid off of that time. And if we have bugs in there, it can really cause an employee's paycheck to be wrong and stuff like that. So it is taken serious, but you know, yeah. Cool. So we are running really low on time, but I want to ask really one quick question. So each of you very briefly, what's one gem that you think is amazing but uh, may not be known by everybody, and you want to mention? Just one. <laughs> not known by everybody. Man, I don't have, I don't have too much to say, but uh, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe this is known, because there's a lot that are known, but there's just a little gem called OJ that parses JSON way better than JSON parse. It's just that simple. You just OJ dump, and it's just way faster. Uh, I'll go with Parallel. I don't know if that's very well known, um, but it's a gem that allows, makes it easier to do multi-threading and multi-processing, which has been great with, we're, doing, we're dealing with a historical database that even in the database that's not historical, meaning the information is deleted whenever we're done with it, we don't keep around a record of Game of Thrones from two years ago. Once that's done, it's expired, they delete it from that database. Our database is historical, so we have millions of rows of information. Um, Parallel makes it so much easier to do a lot of the processing that we need uh, for some of that data. 
You just make me choose one gem out of <laughs> the whole sea of them? No, uh, no, unfortunately, you know, it's not unfortunately. Uh, one that comes to mind is called Floric, and it's, um, uh, it was actually created by the, no, I don't know who it's created by, uh, Adam, I think, a guy named Adam. So anyways, uh, Floric, it's uh, basically if you have email templates that you want your clients to be able to build themselves, but then to interject variables from your database, models, attributes, Floric will allow you to do that. Uh, Shopify has one similar to it. What's it called? Someone know? Yeah. Yes. So um, it's very similar to that, but I found this to just be a lot more lightweight and plug in much nicer. Uh, to my application, so it's a fun one. Cool. Spell that. F L O R R I C K, Floric. Awesome. Well, uh, give them a round of applause. <laughs> this video has been sponsored by Rietta Incorporated. Learn more today at